Welcome to the Cheating Secrets channel. Justine Waters picked up the phone when she heard it buzzing. It was a message from her husband, Tom, who had been out of town for the past few days on business. She unlocked her phone and read the message. The business here is done. The message read, I'm on my way back now. A table for dinner is reserved at 7 p.m. at the restaurant. See you there. Happy anniversary. There were no loving words or affectionate emojis. This didn't surprise her much. For some reason, Tom had been rather distant lately. See you, Justine replied. Happy anniversary. I love you. She sent the message and placed the phone on the nightstand, hoping to see a response. Anything at all. Everything would have been fine. But there was no reply. Justine looked at the clock and realized she had just enough time to get herself ready before meeting her husband. She sighed, got out of bed, and headed to the bathroom to take a shower before meeting him. Who was that? Asked Jake Carter, the man she had just spent the last few hours with. My husband, Justine replied. He let me know he's on his way back. He already reserved a table for us for tonight. It's our fifth anniversary. Your fifth anniversary, huh? Jake asked. I thought you said he went back east. Yes, he was there, Justine replied. Apparently, he managed to finish everything earlier than expected. I need to call my mom and see if she doesn't mind watching little Jacob for a bit longer. All right, then come back to bed, Jake said with a sly smile. Maybe we can give Tom a little gift. Justine scoffed at that. I would love to, Jake, but I really need to get myself together and I don't have much time, she said. Fortunately, I have some clean clothes here that I can put on. I shouldn't meet my husband in the clothes I was wearing here. They're wrinkled and stained. Do you think he knows about us? Justine shook her head. No, I don't think so. Lately, he's been really busy with something. It takes up almost all of his attention. He rarely talks to me and almost never does anything with the baby. It's like he's in a completely different world. How long do you plan on keeping him in the dark? Jake asked. Justine shrugged. Hard to say. He's a good provider. I know he'd be a great father if he wanted to be. Do you think he knows that little Jacob isn't his? If he does, he hasn't said anything. I can't imagine he would let something like that happen without mentioning it to me. Well, I'll be here if you need anything, Jake said. Justine smiled at him, looking down at his small size, which was now resting on his right leg. Just keep it warm for me, okay? She said with a sly smile. You'll get it, baby, he said to her, returning the smile. Justine walked over to the closet and pulled out a clean dress. She couldn't believe how much of her wardrobe was in this closet rather than in the one she shared with her husband. Justine looked at the dress she had chosen, trying to remember if Tom had seen it before. It was blue, falling about seven centimeters above the knee, with a deep, seductive neckline. She was almost certain Tom had seen it before. If not, she would simply tell him she had just bought it. After calling her mother, Justine went to the bathroom and took a nice hot shower, hoping to wash off all traces of Jake before meeting Tom. She had promised herself when she began her affair with Jake 16 months ago that she would never disrespect her husband by giving him anything less than her full attention or letting him touch her while still carrying Jake's essence. At first, Jake understood this, but ever since little Jacob was born just over three months ago, he had started pressuring her to let Tom clean her. Justine told him it was dirty and crude and refused to disrespect her husband in such a way. It was bad enough that she was sleeping with Jake, and even worse that she had given birth to Jake's child, but that was something she would never do. After her shower, Justine brushed her long dark hair until it was just right, got dressed, and applied her makeup. Satisfied that she looked and smelled good enough to pass Tom's scrutiny, she kissed Jake and wished him good night. See you tomorrow at the office? He asked, looking her up and down. Of course, darling. But tonight, duty calls. She grabbed her purse and casually left the room. Tom Waters took a drag from his cigarette, sitting in his Escalade, parked across from the restaurant. He had just received a message from one of the private detectives working for him informing him that Justine had left the luxury condominium belonging to Jay Carter, her lover for the past nearly 18 months, 
He glanced at the photo of her in a blue dress sent by the detective. It wasn't the dress she had worn to Carter's apartment, and of course, Tom had never seen it before. He wasn't surprised. Justine was right about one thing. Tom had been back east, but he returned a day early. He had been explicitly told that there was a serious breach in his security system that needed to be addressed immediately. He was told that if he didn't take care of it, they would. They, of course, referred to a federal agency whose very existence was not even permitted to be known by the public. Tom recalled how nervous he had been sitting in the office of the one-eyed man known only as Alpha One. Only a handful of people were allowed to know this man's real name, and Tom wasn't on that list. You have a serious problem, Waters, the man had said, moving his head in a way that reminded Tom of the actor who once played Moses. And when you have a problem, we all have a problem. Solve this problem, quietly, or I will. Yes, sir, Tom replied. He was smart enough to understand that this was the only acceptable response to Alpha One. He also knew that Alpha One had no qualms about making people disappear. He had heard stories about how Alpha One had once destroyed an entire beach estate along with everyone inside. The thought made Tom shudder. Justine thought Tom was just a well-known traveling salesman who crisscrossed the country, selling his products to various companies looking to upgrade their security systems. But Tom was much more than that. Of course, he did sell security equipment and oversaw its installation. But he was far more than just a salesman. Much more. The equipment he sold and installed was outfitted with special circuits that gave Alpha One's monitors insight into almost everything these companies did. Who they accepted as clients, what they did with their profits, everything. And Tom knew that the problem Alpha was referring to was his wife of five years, Justine. Well, five years up until today. For the past 18 months or so, she had been having a tort affair with Jay Carter, one of the senior partners at the law firm where she worked as a paralegal. Tom didn't know all the details until recently, mainly because he spent a lot of time traveling for work. But he had noticed for some time that something was off between them. By the time he learned the details of the affair, Justine had announced her pregnancy. The lawyer Tom consulted told him that no judge in the state would even consider a divorce while Justine was pregnant. If the child turned out to be his, he would be on the hook for child support regardless of the prenuptial agreement they had both signed. The only thing he didn't have to worry about was the house, which already belonged to him before the marriage. Tom clenched his teeth and remained silent throughout the entire pregnancy, barely keeping his composure when she named the boy Jacob, after his biological father. Shortly after the boy was born, Tom conducted a DNA test. He wasn't surprised to learn that the boy wasn't his. Glancing at his watch, Tom realized that Justine would arrive soon. He saw a man in a khaki jacket standing by the restaurant door with a woman holding a briefcase, and he knew they were there for him. He crossed the street and parked. Grabbing his ubiquitous briefcase, he headed toward the entrance, giving a slight nod to the two people at the door. Tom quietly spoke with the woman at the door and soon found himself seated in a corner booth. The man in khaki and the woman sat in another booth within earshot. Tom thanked the waitress for the water and began browsing the menu. He noticed Justine's arrival at the table and put the menu aside. He stood up as she slid into the booth across from him. Good evening, Justine, he said in a neutral tone. You look very nice tonight. Thank you, Tom, she replied, smiling. I don't recall seeing that dress before. Is it new? Uh, yes, I just bought it. Do you like it? Yes, it really brings out your eyes, he said with a slight smile. After they finished ordering, they heard music playing from another part of the venue. The place was more than just a restaurant. It also had a dance floor and a cocktail bar. It sounds like they're playing our song, Justine said. Tom knew this was her way of saying she wanted to dance. What the heck, he thought. It was their anniversary, even if it would be the last. Care to dance? He asked, standing up. I don't mind, Justine said, extending her hand. Tom took her hand and led her to the dance floor. They danced in each other's arms, but Justine couldn't help but notice that Tom kept a slight distance between them, as if he could barely bring himself to touch her. The song finally ended, and Tom escorted her back to the booth. By that time, their food had arrived, and they began to eat. Is something wrong, Tom? 
Justine asked. You seem so distant. It's our anniversary. Yes, it is, Tom replied. The thing is, your dress smells like it's been hanging in Jake Carter's closet for quite some time. And no matter how hard you tried, you didn't manage to completely wash his stench off your body. What? Justine asked, offended by the way Tom was speaking to her. Jay Carter? Are you serious? She asked, trying unsuccessfully to deflect Tom. Yes, you know Jay Carter, one of the senior partners at the law firm where you work, Tom said nonchalantly. Of course, I know him, Justine replied sarcastically. I certainly hope so, Tom said. After all, you've spent enough time in his bed. Plus, he's the biological father of little Jacob. What are you saying? This is outrageous. I won't sit here and listen to you talk to me like that, she protested. Oh, you will sit, Tom said, opening his briefcase. You'll sit and absorb every bit of information I decide to share with you. Especially after what you've been doing for the past 16 months. What? I don't understand what you're talking about. Of course you do. Let's start with this, he added, tossing a piece of paper in front of her. What is this? This is the DNA test result for your child. According to this, Jacob isn't my son. The next page is another DNA test that proves the donor is none other than your lover, Jake Carter, the man you named Jacob after. How could you have gotten Jake's DNA? She asked in confusion. That was easy. You brought him home with you at least three nights a week. But that's not all. He pulled out a thick folder and dropped it on the table. What is this? A copy of every email, text message, and electronic message between you and Jake over the last 16 months. I hate to break it to you, but there's really no such thing as privacy on the internet. All right, I admit it, she said. Jake and I messed around once, but that was it. And it was just sex. It didn't mean anything. Absolutely nothing. Is that so? Please turn to page 75 and scroll down about halfway until you find the passage I highlighted. Tell me what you see. She flipped through the pages until she reached the one Tom referenced. Her face turned pale as she read her own words to Jake. I'm waiting. I'm reading it, she said quietly. Out loud. I want to hear you say the words you wrote to him. She swallowed and looked at the page again. Please, she pleaded. Don't make me do this. Either you do it, or I will. And if I do, I won't care who hears. Tears streamed down her face as Justine looked back at the paper and began to read the words Tom had highlighted. I love what you do to me, Jake. I've never felt as wonderfully satisfied as I have in the last 16 months. I can't wait for you to knock me up with another baby. I love your size more than Tom's, and I can't wait for the next time you can fill me up she read aloud. In all the time we've been married, I don't recall you ever talking to me like that, Tom said. Is that all you have? She asked nervously. No, I have photos, audio, and video. Hours and hours of video. You must really hate me, Justine said quietly. Yes, I do. She looked up, shocked by what he had just said. It felt like a slap in the face. There was a time when I would have taken a bullet for you. How long have you known? I had suspicions even before you told me you were pregnant. I did a little digging and gathered some evidence, enough to satisfy the prenuptial agreement. However, by the time I talked to the lawyer, you told me you were pregnant. The lawyer made it very clear that no judge would even consider a divorce until after you gave birth, child support and all that. But now that Jacob has been born, I have more than enough evidence to proceed. So, I filed for divorce on the grounds of adultery. Tom gestured toward the two people at the nearby table, who stood up and approached their table. This gentleman has something for you. Miss Justine Waters? The man asked. Yes, Justine said quietly. The man placed a heavy envelope in front of her. You've been served. Served? Justine asked. Tears streaming down her face. Yes, Tom said, handing her a pin. The divorce papers. Take a look at them. They are exactly as we agreed in the prenuptial contract. Sign them now, and I'm ready to give you a cashier's check for $2,039.45.
The exact amount you had when we got married. Don't ask for anything more. I'm already aware of your little secret slush fund. You can keep that. All your things have been delivered to your mother's house. Yes, she knows, and she's very disappointed in you. But she's agreed to let you stay with her until you find a place of your own. For the boy's sake, not yours. But, I don't want a divorce, Justine said. I, I love you. Please, Justine, don't insult my intelligence. Listen. He pulled out his phone and played her conversation with Jake from earlier that day. Her eyes widened as she heard her own voice coming from Tom's phone. How, how did you get that? She asked. Well, I would tell you, but then I'd really have to shoot you on the spot. As much as I hate you right now, I really don't think it would be right to deprive little Jacob of his mother, Tom said with a smile that held no warmth. I was nothing more than a meal ticket and a caretaker for you, while your child's daddy got all the benefits. Just so you know, your ticket has been punched. No more free rides for you. At least, not from me. And what about Jake? She asked. Ah, uh, concerned about daddy, are you? Fortunately, we live in a state that allows for alienation of affection lawsuits. He's being served right now. It might lead to something, or it might not. But it's the principle that matters, isn't it? In any case, his problems are just beginning. You see, today I spoke with Hamilton Parker, your managing partner. I showed him my evidence and expressed my displeasure, knowing that one of his senior partners was involved with a subordinate. Specifically, a subordinate who happens to be my wife. At least, for the time being. Mr. Parker was quite upset and more than a little concerned that Mr. Carter's antics could draw unwanted attention to his firm, not to mention the potential financial burden. He agreed that it would be best if Mr. Carter were no longer associated with the firm and assured me that he would discuss this with his board of directors this evening. He also agreed that it would be wrong to punish you, especially since you're a mother with a newborn child. After all, Mr. Carter was your boss, so to speak and he didn't want to expose the firm to a potential sexual harassment lawsuit. Given your work history there, he agreed it would be best to keep you on board, at least for a while. But I assure you, Mr. Carter's problems are just beginning, Tom said. How much do you really know about your lover? I mean, do you really know him? What are you talking about? Justine asked. I'm talking about his clients. The people he does business with. I mean, who he really represents and what he's doing when he's not shoving you into his mattress. What do you know about that? I don't know. He doesn't talk to me about that kind of stuff. That's probably for the best. Let's just say your Jay Carter has some very interesting clientele. The kind that attracts the attention of certain federal agencies. Agencies that can make a person disappear without a trace. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're scaring me, Tom. And you should be scared, he said. Are you scared enough to stay away from Jay Carter? Because he's going down. And if you're anywhere near him when it happens, you're going down too. Who are you, Tom? She asked. Really? He smiled, nodding toward the papers in front of her. Sign the papers, Justine, and end this farce right now. I've probably already told you too much. And by the way, your credit card has been canceled, and your house key no longer works. I changed the locks today while you were with Jake. I've also taken care of the bank account, so you no longer have access to it. Considering you've been stashing half of your earnings into your own secret account, that shouldn't be a problem for you anyway. You knew everything, didn't you? She asked. Tom shrugged. Defeated, Justine looked over the divorce papers and saw that they were exactly as Tom had said. She signed the papers and handed the pin back to Tom. He smiled took the pin, and reviewed the documents. The process server witnessed the signatures, and the woman accompanying him notarized the signed documents. Tom handed the papers back to the man. I'll make sure these get to your lawyer, Mr. Waters, the man said. Thank you, Tom said. After they left, Tom turned back to Justine. I think you should hand over your rings, he said to her. Do I have to? I love these rings, she exclaimed. Obviously, not enough to stay out of Jay Carter's bed. With tears in her eyes, Justine removed the rings and placed them on the table. He pocketed them before addressing her again. 
I believe our business here is finished. Your conclusion? Is that all you have to say? What else is there to say? Tom asked. Why? Why did you do this on our anniversary? She asked, tears streaming down her face. Do you know how humiliating this is for me? Do you know how humiliating it was for me to find out that you were fooling me all this time? And how humiliating it was to learn that Jacob isn't my son? And how it felt when I found out you slept with Carter on our anniversary? Don't you dare try to guilt trip me, Tom said. We're done. We're completely done. Goodbye, Justine. I never want to see your face again. With those words, he returned to his meal, not looking at Justine, who was wiping her face. The waitress approached and asked if everything was all right. Yes, the meal is excellent as always, Tom said casually. I'll take care of the bill, and I believe the lady will take her meal to go, please. Uh, yes, sir, the waitress replied, leaving to get a takeout box for Justine. She returned a few minutes later and packed Justine's leftovers into a styrofoam container. Tom handed the waitress his credit card and paid for the meal while Justine gathered her things. When the waitress finished, Justine looked at Tom. And that's it? That's it, Tom said, waving her off. She couldn't believe he had just dismissed her so casually. I'm sorry, Tom. He looked up from his meal before speaking. Well, that's something we can both agree on, he said. Now have a good day. Say hello to your mother for me. Oh, and happy anniversary, he added with a slight smile. Justine, unable to believe the calm manner in which her husband had just effectively tossed her out like trash, ran from the table, sobbing. Tom smiled and returned to his meal. He noticed a few patrons looking at him with disdain, but he simply smiled back and shrugged. On the outside, he appeared calm and composed, but inside, he was emotionally shattered. Five years down the drain, at least the worst was behind him now. Tom managed to get through the next few days without incident. It wasn't easy. He had once truly loved Justine, and it hurt him to have to treat her this way. But he decided it was better to do this than to lash out at her the way he had wanted to. Then came the day when he heard a knock at his front door. He was in his master bedroom upstairs and looked out the window to see Carter's sports car in the driveway. He had a feeling something like this would happen, so he had made some enhancements to his home security system at the insistence of Alpha One. He went downstairs and opened the door. Sure enough, it was Jay Carter, and he was furious. Tom stepped back as Carter barged inside. You son of a bitch. You cost me my job, and Justine doesn't even want to talk to me. I'm going to kill you, you fucking piece of shit. Jake yelled, his face red with anger. He advanced on Tom until he noticed 15 tiny red dots suddenly appearing on his shirt. Alert. Intrusion. Blared an electronic voice from speakers embedded in the walls. Do not move. What the hell is this? Screamed the uninvited guest. He raised his hands as if trying to brush off the dots. Suddenly, there was a sharp sound, like a shot from a pneumatic rifle. When Jake looked down, he saw 15 darts sticking out of his body. He tried to reach up, but he never made it. His eyes rolled back, and his body collapsed to the floor. I don't think you'll be killing anyone today, Carter, Tom said calmly, grabbing his phone. He pressed an icon on the phone and heard a male voice. Operator 1211. Clean up in aisle 15, Tom said. Clean up in aisle 15. Understood, the man replied. Tom pressed another icon, and the systems that had just fired a load of tranquilizer darts into Jake turned and retracted back into the ceiling. Once the panels closed, there was no indication that anything had been there. Tom smiled. Satisfied that the new security system had worked as promised. A few minutes later, an unmarked white van pulled into the driveway. Several men in Tyvek suits entered the house and dragged Jake's limp body out. One of them grabbed Jake's keys and got into the sports car. Within minutes, the van and Jake's sports car were gone. Tom closed the door and went about his business. A few days later, after Tom had bought a caramel mocha at the local coffee shop, a large man in a dark suit and sunglasses stopped him on the street. Alpha One wants to talk to you, Mr. Waters, the man growled. Right now. All right, Tom said, 
a bit taken aback by the man's demeanor. He followed the man to a long black limousine parked at the curb and got inside after the man opened the back door. Waters, good to see you're still free, said Alpha One after the door closed. Uh, yes, sir. I've been keeping busy, Tom replied. Alpha One smiled and placed a friendly hand on Tom's shoulder. Please, Tom, when it's just the two of us, you can call me Regis, said the one-eyed man. I wanted to give you an update on Mr. Carter. He's singing like a canary. Thank you, Alpha, uh, Regis. So, he's telling us everything we need to know? Tom asked. Oh, yes, he's doing it full throttle, Regis said. But right now, he's literally singing like a canary. It seems the combination of those tranquilizer darts from your new security system and the serum we used to extract the information we needed has turned his brain to applesauce. Right now, he's swinging in a metal cage and chirping like a bird. Oh, Tom said. Regis pulled an envelope from his jacket pocket and handed it to Tom. We managed to get him to settle with you out of court before he became too incompetent to sign his name, Regis said. He was so grateful to be alive that he agreed to much more than you originally wanted. Well, that's good to hear, Tom said. By the way, I want you to know I'm really impressed with your new system, Regis said. Now that we've gotten what we needed from Carter, I'm glad you didn't use the .50 caliber chain guns I suggested. So am I, Tom said. I just had my carpet cleaned. Regis chuckled at that. Have you heard anything about Justine? Tom asked. Yes, she's back at work, though Mr. Parker is keeping her on a very short leash. Did you ever mention to her who you actually work for? Regis asked. No, Regis, I never did, Tom replied. Regis nodded. He already knew this from his monitoring devices, but wanted to hear it from Tom personally. Good, Regis said. Well, when your divorce is finalized, I'd like you to come to headquarters. I'd like to introduce you to your new partner. Partner? Tom asked. I've never needed a partner before. Well, there's a first time for everything, isn't there, Tom? Uh, yes, sir. I suppose there is, Tom said. Good, Regis said. Then I look forward to seeing you. So do I, Regis, Tom said. The door opened, signaling the end of the meeting. Tom stepped out of the limousine and watched as the large man squeezed into the driver's seat. As the long car merged into traffic, Tom wondered what Regis had in store for him. Thank you for listening until the end. See you in the next episode of Cheating Secrets. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. Goodbye.